Let's talk about what would have been the single greatest fighter ever to fly, at least to date, and why the U.S. Air Force opted not to buy it back in 2018. Now, over the years, there have been a lot of incredible fighter proposals that didn't get picked up for one reason or another, from the F-20 Tiger Shark to the F-16XL to the YF-23 or the FB-22, but one stands head and shoulders above all the rest, and that's a program that I like to call the F-22B Joint Strike Raptor. Now, this program came about in 2018, but to understand why, we need to jump back to 2011, when the F-22 Raptor's production line was unceremoniously halted after just 186 fighters were delivered out of a 750 fighter order. Now, canceling the Raptor ultimately came down to a combination of politics and economics. In 2006, when the cancellation decision was made, the Soviet Union had been gone for a decade and a half, and China's Xi Jinping, with his military modernization efforts, wouldn't take power for another five or six years to come. And at the time, the U.S. was looking to free up budget, for the global war on terror. And the F-22 was ultimately sacrificed on that very altar. Now, if the Air Force had received all 750 Raptors that they ordered to replace their aging F-15 fleet, I can tell you with some confidence that the Air Force would not be developing a sixth generation air superiority fighter in their next generation air dominance program today. That would be maybe 10 years further out and we'd be talking about a much bigger F-22 upgrade plan right now. But by the mid-2010s, the Air Force was recognizing that its 150 F-22s would be aging out of service in the not-too-distant future. And with Russia's Su-57 and China's J-20 now heading for service, the Air Force would need an air superiority fighter that could stand and swing with the best of them. So in cooperation with the Navy and DARPA, or the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, they kicked off a classified X-plane program under the name Next Generation Air Dominance. And while the results of this program are still classified, we're aware that they are actively working their way towards service. But by 2016 or so, even Congress recognized that canceling F-22 production was awfully short-sighted. The 150 combat-ready Raptors we have are quickly logging hours, meaning they'll be aging out of service in the not-too-distant future. And with sixth-generation fighters still more than a decade away, Congress mandated a secret study into the cost of restarting F-22 production. Now, the Air Force based their assessment on the idea of producing 194 new F-22 Raptors, just like the ones already in service, because that was the fewest number they felt they would need to make the aircraft sustainable for a longer duration of time. And they immediately ran into a huge problem. You see, when F-22 production halted in 2011, all of the factory space, facilities, equipment was all redirected toward F-35 production to bring down its overall production costs. And all of the employees trained to build this stealth fighter had long since moved on to other employment. So, in order to start building new F-22s, the Air Force would have to build new factories, establish new supply chains, purchase new equipment, recreate the tooling, and train an entirely new workforce to get these jets out. And that came with a massive price tag. All told, they estimated it would cost about $50 billion in February 2017 money to purchase 194 new F-22s. Now that shakes out to around $63 billion by today's inflation and around $272 million per new build F-22 Raptor. Now, just to cover all the bases, the Rand Corporation was also asked to conduct their own independent study into restarting F-22 production, and they based their assessment on building just 75 new fighters. But they came to a very similar conclusion, ultimately determining that with that smaller overall order, we'd be looking at more like $335 million per F-22 in today's currency. It was around $266 million in 2017. 
And it was at around that point that Congress and the Air Force recognized that they were better served by making those 150 F-22s as sustainable as possible and waiting for the next generation air dominance fighter to emerge. It was just too much money for too short term a game. But that wasn't the end of this story, because less than a year later, Japan was on the market for their own new stealth air superiority fighter. Now, they were already purchasing F-35s at the time, but the F-35 is an attack or air to ground oriented fighter, and they wanted an air superiority focused fighter to help deter China's J-20. So they let the market know that they were looking for a stealth air superiority fighter that they could purchase for around $133 million per airframe. And Lockheed Martin responded with a proposal that was over budget, but also would be the most capable air superiority fighter I've ever heard of to date. This is where the Joint Strike Raptor comes in. Lockheed Martin's proposal was for a sort of Frankenfighter that would incorporate all of the best elements of the F-22 Raptor's design with all the advanced technologies found in today's F-35. This aircraft would have had the F-22's aerobatically capable exterior shape, as well as the Pratt & Whitney F-119 afterburning turbofan engines that give it 70,000 pounds of thrust, as well as the ability to super cruise, or fly at speeds of Mach 1.5 five or better without the use of the afterburner. Not to mention thrust vector control, which increases control while flying at a high angle of attack or at high altitude, as well as making it possible to perform incredible aerobatic maneuvers. On the outside, it would have looked very much like today's Raptor, but the similarities wouldn't even be skin deep. Today's F-22s cost about $88,000 per hour to operate, versus the F-35 at around $30,000 an hour. And a big part of the difference there is the immense cost of maintenance on the F-22's polymer-based radar absorbent coating, or radar absorbent material, often called RAM. Now, the F-35 also has RAM, but a more advanced version that's actually baked right into the polymer skin of the aircraft. And this new F-22B Joint Strike Raptor would have had the very same, dramatically reducing operating costs, maybe not all the way down to F-35 range, but much closer to it. And while today's F-22 doesn't have an infrared search and track or electro-optical targeting capability, the F-35 not only does, but has the most advanced system on the planet. The F-35's ANAAQ-37 Infrared Electro-Optical Distributed Aperture System comes with six infrared cameras mounted all around the aircraft, making it possible to detect and even target enemy aircraft using infrared rather than radar with full 360 degree coverage. In fact, you can even use this system to look through the body of the aircraft, making it effectively invisible to the pilot via their helmet-mounted display while flying at night. This would also allow this new Joint Strike Raptor to leverage the capabilities of advanced weapons like the AIM-9X to their fullest extent, which today's F-22s simply can't. Right now, F-22 pilots need to orient the nose of their aircraft toward their opponent to target them and launch a missile at them. But with this electro-optical targeting system, Joint Strike Raptor pilots could literally look at an enemy aircraft anywhere around them and target them with their line of sight. And with weapons like the AIM-9X that can pull greater than 60 Gs, that means you can launch missiles at aircraft that are flying directly behind you. It also would have come with the F-35's ANASQ-239 Electronic Warfare Suite, which is the most advanced on any fighter that isn't a dedicated electronic warfare platform. And if that isn't enough, the F-35's ANAPG-81 Active Electronically Scanned Array Radar is so powerful that it can actually be used for electronic warfare itself. In fact, it's said to be just as potent as the EA-18G Growler, which is a dedicated electronic warfare aircraft. The only practical difference as far as publicly disclosed information is concerned is that the Growler's larger dedicated EW pod can jam a larger expansive area at once. It comes with a 40 degree jamming area versus the F-35's radars two degree, meaning the F-35 has to be specific in the targets that it chooses to jam, but it can jam enemy radar just as effectively. 
It's almost impossible to overstate how capable this fighter would be as compared to the jets it would be squaring off against. We're talking about the F-35's data-fusing supercomputing capabilities that provide pilots with more situational awareness than any pilots have ever had before in history. Helmet-mounted targeting that can identify friendly and enemy assets from a significant range while connected to an active network that can determine the types of threats that you're facing and provide real-time information about their exact capabilities. This is an avionics suite that's so advanced that it is widely understood to make older, fourth-generation fighters just flying in the neighborhood more capable as a result of the data that it can relay. And cramming that all into a fighter that is already the most dominant air superiority fighter in the world. And here's the real kicker. This plan would have been way cheaper than building new, old F-22 Raptors. Because this would effectively amount to just expanding the F-35's internals into a new fuselage, Lockheed Martin said they could produce these aircraft for only around $177 million per fighter. Now, adjusted for today's inflation, we're talking $213 million per fighter today. But by now, some of you are already asking, isn't the F-22 export banned? And you're right, there would have to be legislation that would come with this proposal. But in return, the U.S. Air Force would be able to purchase these advanced new Joint Strike Raptors right alongside Japan, expanding its own F-22 fleet with significantly more capable air superiority fighters for a whole lot less than their own estimates for purchasing new, old Raptors. The idea was basically for Japan to foot most of the bill of kickstarting production and then allowing the United States to just purchase aircraft once they started rolling off the assembly line. Now, where exactly that production would take place was never quite clear, and many of the documents associated with this proposal have never been released to the public. But ultimately, both Japan and the U.S. Air Force decided that despite the insane capability such a fighter would bring to the table, we are still talking about an airframe designed in the 1980s and 1990s, and avionics that were designed in the 1990s and early 2000s. In other words, both nations recognized that despite the immense capability this aircraft would offer, it would be somewhat dated, and they could ultimately produce better aircraft just a few years down the road with more modern systems on board and a more modern approach to stealth. Now today, the F-22 is undergoing a massive $11 billion upgrade that will very likely include electro-optical targeting capabilities and infrared search and track, bridging the gap a bit between today's F-22s and what the Joint Strike Raptor could have been. But the F-35 is about to kick off Block 4, which will be a massive upgrade in onboard hardware and software, not to mention weapons the platform can leverage, and a whole bunch more. In other words, the Joint Strike Raptor would be looking at a Block 4 upgrade today as well. Now, to be clear, the fighter that emerges from the next generation air dominance program is all but assured to be significantly better than even what this Joint Strike Raptor could have been. And I also want to be clear that that's a name that I made up. This proposal never got an official designation. Nonetheless, if you ask me, the Joint Strike Raptor proposal represents the single biggest missed opportunity in fighter design in history at least so far. And if the fighter that emerges from the NGAD program ultimately fails to live up to expectations, you better expect to hear me complaining about just what a big missed opportunity it was.